back to another video from HSTV and in today's video as you can see by the video title I am going to be telling you exactly how you can build a competitive specialty training portfolio whilst you are at medical school. So if you're new to the channel and you don't know who I am my name is Heen Shimaz. I'm a fifth year medical student here at the University of Edinburgh and I want to do cardiothoracic surgery but you will know if you have seen the recent competition ratios that cardiothoracic specialty training applications have become very, very competitive. In fact, it's something like 45 for one place. So that means I really have to plan ahead and get my organization right from the beginning. Now, the first thing to say is have a good mindset. Okay, like with all good things in life, it all starts up here. It is never too early to start building up a portfolio. You're going to lose nothing by networking and gaining mentorship and research and leadership. You're gonna lose nothing from that. So as long as it's not burning you out and as long as uh, you're able to manage it within your medical school schedule, you're always gonna gain lots of transferable skills regardless of wherever you end up in medicine. So it doesn't matter if you're a first year watching this or like a sixth year, fifth year, uh, this is relevant for all medical students. Now, one of the first things that you wanna do if you are thinking about the next five, 10 years of your life is to actually familiarize yourself with specialty training pathways. What happens after foundation year two? When we're at medical school, we're always told that, oh, you'll do FY1, then you'll do FY2. But beyond that, I feel that we're not really given the right um, level of education to plan out career routes. So I'd highly recommend that you go on uh, like at the NHS websites and really find out about specialties. So for example, uh, me wanting to do cardiothoracic surgery, there is a self-assessment matrix that is released in every October. Uh, I'll leave some of these links in the description as well, by the way. And that really helps to guide some of the activities that I'm involving myself in. So although the main goal for me right now as a medical student isn't necessarily to gain points, it's more to gain experience and exposure to the field, Along the way, if I can gain some points, that's always going to be beneficial for me. And especially with something like cardiothoracics, I know that even if I don't end up doing cardiothoracics at the end of the day, the stuff that I'm doing will count towards my portfolio in other specialties. So definitely know what your goals are and what you're working towards. Keep your options open. Even if you are fixed on a specialty, for example, like myself, wanting to do cardiothoracics, most specialties don't require all of your research or your academic work or your publications and presentations to be within that certain specialty. Most specialties will be fine with you publishing whatever. So keep an open mind when it comes to opportunities. Don't turn something down just because it's not cardiothoracic surgery. One of the keys to building a portfolio is mentorship and networking. Now, mentorship can range from people who are just like a year older than you, all the way up to consultants in the field. So every single person at every stage does have valuable insight and advice and guidance for you to help you plan your next stage. So I would say don't be afraid to reach out to people, whether that's sending out emails or whether that's people that you've met in person. That's always the best interactions because it just feels more human. So whether you're on placement and you meet some friendly clinicians, someone that inspires you, or even if it's an older medical student, you can reach out to just to ask for some guidance. Now certainly for some people that you really look up to and you really want to be a part of their research group or whatever, really be direct with them and say, look, I'm really interested in this specialty or I'm interested in building up my portfolio. Would you be happy to take on the role of a mentor for me? And that kind of puts a bit of a responsibility on this other person uh, to help you out actively. Because sometimes you'll have some professional relationships and some opportunities that don't really work out. People are not responding to emails and, you know, stuff just doesn't work out. So I think from the beginning, be really clear with your goals. What are you trying to get out of this interaction? And then how are you gonna move forward? So set yourself goals and make sure you communicate them clearly with your mentors. Research. Let's talk about publication, presentations, and how you actually get involved with the world of academia. So if you're at Edinburgh Medical School, it's easy because you do your SSC project, your Student Selected Component Project, which runs in years one, two, and five. Now, I'm sure other universities as well, because academia is such a big thing nowadays, there will be research projects that are part of your course as compulsory components. This has a few benefits to those of us trying to build up our portfolios. 
one, you're going to be working in a group that has to put in the work. So, you know, although there might be some people who are not interested in research, it's a really useful skill to have as a clinician. So you will have a group already put together for you. Secondly, in terms of idea generation, so with SSC projects, especially in years one and two at Edinburgh, you have a list of projects and a list of supervisors who are happy to run those projects. They are bound with the university to guide you and help you out. So uh, it's another advantage for you. You won't have to go out of your way to think of ideas or find supervisors. Thirdly, the university will approve any ethical considerations and any ethical applications because it's run under the university, right? So if you're doing any kind of data collection, the process is actually explained to you and it's guided in a much better manner as if, you know, you're comparing it to doing it all on your own. Sometimes the guidance is not always there. So that's another reason. And fourthly, because actually the work that you produce is of pretty good quality. You know, you're under a really good institution, you have support behind you, and you've got a good group as well. So taking things further from a coursework project is really advantageous. It's something that you're having to do anyway, so it doesn't take up an extra part of your timetable. And getting it published, you can just stay in touch with the supervisors afterwards and they'll be able to guide you on getting it to publication. Now, obviously some of your group members who are not keen on research might not want to work on this project any further than the university deadlines, which is fine, but you just have to accept that any extra work that you put in, you still have to credit your group for obviously helping out, but you might have to go, you know, a little bit further to get something to a publication level. But how about if you're trying to organize a research project on your own terms, as in away and external from the university? So again, this is a good idea. There's nothing to stop you doing that as long as you have the right kind of supervision. Now, what I mean by this is sometimes clinicians are super busy and they don't have any projects for you. So it's not always enough just to go and ask people for research projects. Sometimes you have to be a little bit more enthusiastic and do a bit of your own research. Think of niche topics where there might be gaps in the market, in a field, and then approach a supervisor who you think would be able to guide you on that. Now, projects like systematic reviews, uh, case studies, literature reviews, meta-analyses, these are really easy kind of projects because they can be done sitting at home and they rarely require like ethical approval. So most supervisors will be okay with uh, you sending them drafts and for them to advise you on journals that your work could be published in. Now, they're obviously the experts in their field, so they can also guide you on the topic. But if you are going in with absolutely nothing, sometimes, you know, clinicians, they don't have a time uh, slot allocated to help you out and they might have to go out of their way to think of projects. Whereas if you're going in with a topic that you're interested in, something that you've already looked into, you know, you come across better, your impression is better, but also uh, that enthusiasm takes you a long way in people helping you out. Now let's talk about leadership positions. This is something that can also give you good points on your portfolio, but also as a transferable skills, leadership skills are super important for your role as a doctor. It's one of the key things that differentiates you from other healthcare professionals. So if you wanna be involved in leadership, then you have to apply, you have to keep a lookout, and you have to start somewhere small, somewhere regional, before you work your way up to more national or international leadership positions. That's just how it works. So my advice to you, honestly, would be to get a Facebook account, get an Instagram account, get a X account, follow society channels that you are interested in, start local with your university and build your skills up before applying to more major national leadership roles. Now, for me personally, I started off as some kind of events manager at um, Edinburgh University's Cardiovascular Society. I did a bit of work being a secretary for Edinburgh University's Cardiothoracic Society, just working my way through those kind of roles. Then my first kind of major role was being president of Bay Medics. And then now I've been able to apply to a national society, SCTS InSync, which is the National Society of um, Medical Students in Cardiothoracic Surgery. So you can see that it's not been like an easy journey. It's not something that I've just applied to straight away. And in fact, the responsibility is far greater. So if I had done that, I wouldn't have been able to actually run the committee um, or gain much from it. So you do have to build yourself up. And there's so many skills in leadership that are gained from experience. So I'd highly recommend that you get started from uh, early years of medical school and work your way up. 
Alright guys, well that is going to be the end of this video. I hope that this has been useful for you and now you don't feel so scared about building a portfolio at medical school. If you have any questions for me, please do leave them down in the comments or you can DM me on Instagram. I also have a TikTok now by the way. So it's all at HSTV official. Go follow me there for all the behind the scenes and I'll see you all in my next video. Thank you.